Does your body pick fights with itself? Are you attacking stuff that shouldn't be attacked? Do you have an autoimmune disease? Then join the club, so do I. Today we're gonna to talk about the only root causes of autoimmunity and the way that we need to frame this group of conditions ranging from type 1 diabetes to rheumatoid arthritis to Hashimoto's and Graves' disease to MS and a whole slew of others in between. Join me as we talk about the real, the only root causes of autoimmunity. But first, a history lesson and science lesson, I suppose. So back in the day, people with autoimmunity would be told or they would grow to assume that their immune system was overactive. That's why they were told that they can't take things like echinacea and elderberry for a long time because my immune system's already so hyperactive, it's attacking me. So of course I don't want to stimulate it further when it's already overstimulated. Well, that's the old model of autoimmunity. But unfortunately, this old model of autoimmunity has stuck around and persisted to some degree into the current day and age. I'm still seeing patients now in the 2020s that are telling me I have an autoimmune disease so I can't take X, Y, or Z herb. And it's not that simple and it's not exactly true. I've seen a lot of autoimmune people who actually have weaker immune systems. They have low or low normal white blood cell counts. They don't stand a chance against infectious disease. They get colds and flus all the time. They get much more sick when they do get a cold or a flu. So clinically speaking, what I have seen and what I've experienced with my own health is that people with autoimmunity don't have overzealous, overactive immune systems. It's actually maybe the opposite. You might have a weak immune system. Now I'm gonna frame this in a little bit of a different way in just a moment, but keeping in mind overactive, overzealous immune response is not really the accurate current model of autoimmunity. It's immune dysregulation that we need to talk about. And we need to talk about what root causes would dysregulate or confuse the immune system. So keep that in the back pocket of your mind. But first, I just want to give you like the two second crash course on your immune system. This is a gross oversimplification, but it is what it is. So you have two arms of your immune system. We have the innate immune system. This would be things like dendritic cells and macrophages. Many of these cells, but not all of them, are called antigen presenting cells or APCs. And what these guys do is they're sampling the environment. They're sampling little bits of food, little bits of bacteria, viruses, debris, self tissue. They're sampling little nibbles of your own body. And they're bringing all of that back to their bodies on the other side. And here I should get these names. So again, innate immunity. And again, specifically talking about APCs. And then we have the adaptive immune response. So this would be things like T cells and B cells. These are the guys that receive the information from these other cells. They receive those little particles of whatever food, bacteria, etc., that, that got passed to them. And then they decide what to do. They decide, is this friend or is this foe? Should I attack it or should I gobble it up or should I leave it alone or should I do something cool with it? I don't know. So now that you know a little bit more about how the immune system works, now let's rewind and talk about what things would dysregulate or otherwise perturb the immune response. And one way that I like to talk about this, I, I think that this makes the most sense to me at least, is picture that you are working a desk job. You're in a cubicle, you have your little computer, you've got your stack of paperwork, but it's a good job. It's a normal nine to five, you never have to work overtime, your boss gives you deadlines, but there are deadlines that you are able to meet. You're able to keep up with the workflow. There's adequate staffing. So if you need to send something over to Cheryl in the cubicle next door, she can do her job. You have the staff to take on other responsibilities so you're not overburdened. Everything's going smoothly. And while every person in every job on planet Earth is gonna have some small error rate in their work, a person in that environment is going to have a pretty low error rate, right? Like they might have a little goofy typo here or there, but probably not anything catastrophic and it's not going to be super frequent. Now, imagine if you will, same person, same cubicle, same job, but now there were budget cuts. And now 50% of the workers in that office were laid off, which means that you get a lot more responsibilities. Also imagine that the new company gave you a new boss and the new boss sucks so bad. 
and that jerk is putting pile after pile after pile of paperwork on your desk, mile high stacks of paper, and that boss is telling you, you better get this done by three o'clock or your ass is grass. And you have to work overtime, you have to work weekends, you're not compensated fairly, you're working like 15 jobs at once. How many errors do you think you are going to produce in your work? A lot. That person is overwhelmed, they're scrambling, they're desperately just trying to churn out some sort of work and get the stamp of approval and just keep afloat. That is an environment where the person is frazzled and overwhelmed and they're going to make a lot of whoopsie daisies. Well, same thing happens with the poor immune system. If you have a healthy immune response and healthy microbes and healthy stimulation and good nutrition and good sleep and you're not super hella stressed out, your immune system can keep up. It's like that first scenario where it's, it's a desk job, but the place is well staffed, you're well compensated, you don't work overtime, you have a good boss, you have deadlines, but they're manageable. That is scenario A. Scenario B, when the SHIT hits the fan, that is what we're going to talk about. So what things would add a tremendous burden to the immune system or make it really frazzled and scrambly and frantic, or what would make it so the immune system is struggling to keep up with the demands of its job. That's what I want you to keep in mind. So let's get into what those root causes actually are. I hope the lead in for this video was worth it because I didn't think these would make sense without that little back background story. So number one, this should be a total no brainer, especially for people who are familiar with this channel. Let's just say, Let's just say critters. This could be bacteria, virus, fungi, parasite, you name it. And this could be an over infection like the Rona or pneumonia or salmonella or giardia, or it could be something a bit more subtle, a state of dysbiosis where you are no longer living in harmony with your microbial community and they're sending weird signals to these antigen presenting cells, right? Because the antigen presenting cells are sampling stuff from the gut, including the microbiome. And these microbes are speaking to the APCs all the time. So this can take on multiple kind of um, multiple different versions, but I would say critters is one of the big ones and now we're at a point you know three plus years down the road from the pandemic i can tell you i have had many patients now who did not have an autoimmune disease and they acquired one or they developed one after getting that infection so infections or dysbiosis something to do with the critters is a huge stimulatory event for the immune system and if it surpasses what the immune system is able to handle then errors Oh, whoops, now I'm attacking your joints. Whoops, sorry, bro. Next up on the list, this is an underappreciated function of the immune system, but it's uh, a little bit in the same vein. And that is injury. We've all had little scrapes and bruises and cuts. We probably all have broken bones at some point. Not a big deal. But what people don't realize is the cleanup crew that comes in and gobbles up all of the debris of the dead tissue and the necrotic tissue and remodels the environment, the part of your body that does that is the immune system. So if you have an injury that again, if you have an injury that surpasses your capabilities for healing and it's overly burdensome to the immune system, an injury could be enough to provoke an autoimmune disease because now you have something that's putting a strain on the immune system. It's overtaxed, it's overworked. You have an inflammatory environment probably because there's tissue debris and there's an injury present and your poor body's trying to bring blood flow and bring platelets and bring stuff to the area to heal it. You're sucking up resources like nutrients and, and vitamins trying to heal that tissue. And now what you also get here, which is important, when there's an injury and there's dead little bits of debris of tissue, those bits of tissue are also antigens which get sampled by the local antigen presenting cells. So if you sprain your ankle and you have little bits and fragments of injured ankle tissue hanging around, your immune system 
is rightfully so sampling a little bit of that injured dead tissue and bringing it back to these guys so that they can make a decision on what to do about it. But again, if you have an inflammatory environment or if this was a big enough injury that exceeded your capacity for healing, tissue injury, antigens getting turned up in the tissue, antigen presentation, boom, that could potentially incite an autoimmune disease. Now, I keep saying for both of these, I keep saying if the illness or injury surpasses your ability to heal or surpasses the immune system's abilities, right? That's really key because that goes back to the idea of resilience. It goes back to the cliff metaphor, which I shared in some previous videos on root causes, but also it goes back to nutrition, right? So let's talk about, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be lazy and write newt. Um, let's talk about nutrition. So when you have an infection, as one example, you're gonna need more vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc. I mean, every cell in your body needs B vitamins and nutrients. You're gonna need adequate stimulation from your microbiome. So that's where things like fiber and prebiotics and polyphenols come into play. So certainly your relationship to critters and your, um, your ability to manage critters is very heavily influenced by nutrition, whether you're getting vitamins and minerals and fiber and color in your diet, namely. But also if you think of an injury, well, you're gonna need some of those cofactors and some of those nutrients that I mentioned because this is an inherently immunologi immunological event, but also you might need more protein to build new structures. You might need, um, I'm trying to think of something specific to injury. Omega-3s. I talked about this in the curing period cramps video that I did recently, but the omega-3 and omega-6 ratio in your body is going to influence what prostaglandins you make and how inflamed the tissues are. Omega-3s have a huge role to play in recovery from injury and how much of that injured tissue is getting sampled and carted over to the immune system and how efficiently that immune system response is, is orchestrated in the tissues. That's a whole fascinating topic for another day, but omega-3 is hugely important for injury purposes. So if you've been eating a standard American diet or not getting enough you know, fish and seafood in your diet, that could be the thing that makes the difference between, oh, this is a big deal, but my immune system is able to handle it. And this is a big deal, it surpasses my ability or my immune system's abilities. And now off into autoimmune, never, never land I go. Now, another one is, uh, let's just call it toxic stuff. I'll put that in quotes. You could call it toxicants. We don't have to get fancy with this conversation, but if you get exposure to something really nasty and chemically, so I'm talking like higher doses in particular of things like BPA and plastics and uh, parabens and phthalates and pesticides and herbicides, particularly bigger exposures, but little ones still might matter. But toxic stuff, one of the ways that it disrupts the immune response is that it depletes your glutathione. And if you remember from a handful of videos ago where I talked about glutathione in depth, glutathione is the master detoxifier, which is why it's relevant here and it gets depleted here. But also it is one of the things that tells your immune system, hey, don't attack everything you see, <laughs> just chill. So if you're sucking up all your glutathione for detoxification and you don't have enough left over to use for your immune response, that can also put your immune system in a more inflammatory state, and then off you go, off to the races, boom, squirreliness. And I will point out, if you remember from that glutathione video, nutrition plays a huge role in glutathione production. So are you getting enough glycine and cysteine? Are you getting things like vitamins and minerals and cofactors? Are you getting it for this channel and the people who watch this channel, are you getting enough sulfur? Or are you going on a low sulfur bend because you're convinced that you have hydrogen sulfide SIBO? These are really huge, important nutritional components that go into the detoxification thing. And it all goes into this conversation of autoimmunity. And then last but not least, I do want to throw out, I think that there's a, I guess we could say, 
5 and 6. I think we can talk about them in the same breath, but I do want to make mention of stress and sleep. You go long enough with crappy sleep, you are more prone to all sorts of squirrely things. Everything from, you know, uh, neurocognitive impairment, dementia, and neurological conditions, to autoimmune disease, to cancer. You look up an inflammatory or chronic illness and you look up that with the word sleep on PubMed, I guarantee you, you're gonna find something. Sleep is so important. And it's, it's also a point where we kind of clean up house. We clean up old bits of debris and dead tissue and we do a little bit of autophagy cleanup. And that's really important for the immune system. So sleep, important for human beings in general, if you wanna be healthy, but especially important for the immune system. And then last but not least, stress. I have seen many cases where somebody develops an autoimmune condition or IBS or SIBO, and the only thing that makes sense in their health history is that they were really stressed at the time. Usually it's something pretty big, like, oh, I, I just had a ton of stuff happen all at once. I got married, I moved, I got, I got a new job and somebody died. Sometimes it's just one single event. Sometimes it's something that doesn't sound like a big event to anybody else, but to you, it was extremely stressful. But remember that stress chemistry has an effect on every tissue of the body, including but not limited to your immune system. And it stress chemistry tends to put your immune system in a more reactive, protective state, and it depletes you of glutathione also. So quasi-related to the toxic stuff conversation, stress can absolutely be an instigator of autoimmunity. But again, I think the commonality for all of these things is that any of these things could exceed the immune system's capacity to do its job. So that poor person who's in the cubicle and they're totally overworked and they're scrambling, picture that for your immune system. And these are things that we can start to pluck away at. Now, if you already have an autoimmune disease, I'm not going to say that you can cure it. You could put it in remission, certainly, but I don't know if you're going to be able to cure it. But why not start plucking away at each of these things and just try to make your body as healthy as humanly possible? Because I'll tell you one thing about autoimmunity that sucks. Once you pop the fun, don't stop. Once you get one autoimmune disease, you become much more likely to develop a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth. And it's not uncommon to see people who have many different autoimmune conditions, probably because one of these root causes was never addressed and it persisted and it continued to overwhelm and overburden the immune system. And then it's just a matter of time before that poor little office worker makes another error. So take care of your immune system in the here and now try to tackle each of these things. I have videos and podcast episodes on each and every one of these topics if you want more of a deep dive. But in my opinion, these are the only six root causes for autoimmunity. Of course, if the thought of watching all my multitude of YouTube videos and podcast episodes sounds like a huge time commitment and is a bit overwhelming, I can't blame you. If you want something more streamlined and just cut to the chase, what do I need to do, man? I'd encourage you to check out FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days. This is my group coaching program. We're going to be enrolling again in August. We enroll in February and August every year. But even though it is intrinsically a gut healing class, for those of you who know me, I take a very holistic view of IBS and SIBO, and I heal the gut by healing head to toe. We don't just laser focus on the gut and ignore the rest of the body in my world. We have to focus on the entire body and build health from the inside out, outside in, and everything in between. So really, we cover five out of the six of these in depth in that program. We talk about critters, obviously, because it's a gut healing program. We wouldn't talk about the gut without talking about the microbiome in this day and age. We talk about nutrition at nauseum. We talk about sleep and stress at nauseum. And we even talk about toxic boogeyman and detoxification stuff as well. The only one we really don't cover a ton is the injury thing, but I'm happy to talk about it on a group Q&A in FODMAP Freedom, like that's always an option. We talk about all sorts of random stuff on the Q&As. So I guess my point is, if you just want to cut the overwhelm and not have to do this on your own and not have to figure it out and triage this on your own, there is a community and there is guidance waiting for you in the FODMAP Freedom community. And I would love to see you there in August, or again, if you're watching this video a little bit later on in February, but I would love to see you there. I really think I can help you. And I say that because we've had some really great stories and testimonials 
people who have never pooped normally in their life and now like they just forgot that they ever had IBS and they're totally normal and skipping through the rainbows and eating the garlic and the guacamole. We have people who couldn't look cross-eyed at uh, more than 12 foods without getting bloated and having IBS symptoms and now their diet is super diverse and healthy and colorful. So if this is appealing to you or if you just want a community and that support, check out FODMAP Freedom. There's a wait list that you can join 365 days of the year. And then when we are enrolling, by joining that wait list, you're gonna be the first to know when we enroll and you're gonna get some emails and some offers and there's always a bonus gift when you enroll early. And you can always get on a call with a FODMAP Freedom coach to talk about the program and see if you're a right fit when we get into that enrollment period. So join the wait list. If you're even thinking about joining FODMAP Freedom, I would love to see you there. In the meantime, I will see you right back here on YouTube for another video next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.